Um, I welcome everyone to our third class on the Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm excited about today. Uh, th I know we've had a little bit of a break, but hopefully we're not going to do too much review. We're just sort of going to get right into it with the Christ-shaped spirit today. But before we do, uh, Paul Zock is going to open us with a song, and then I'll say a prayer, and we will jump in. Over to you, Paul. All right. Lyrics are in the chat, as usual. It's another old hymn. Holy Ghost, with light divine, shine upon this heart of mine. Chase the shades of night away. Turn my darkness into day. The Holy Ghost with power divine guilty heart of mine long had sin without control held dominion over my soul Holy Ghost with joy divine Sad and heart of mine, bid my many woes depart. Heal my wounded, bleeding heart. Holy Spirit, all divine. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. Thanks. Uh, let us pray. Holy Ghost, uh, with light divine, we pray that you would illuminate um, the material today. Be with us uh, even through the zeros and the ones of Zoom, uh, and um, give us uh, new understanding and hope today. Uh, as we uh, delve deeper into this important subject. For Christ's sake, amen. Okay. Jen, can we keep sharing my screen? Um, you can share your screen. I turned it off just so we could see Paul. Oh, okay, great. Okay, I'm going to share it again. All right. So... Before we begin, uh, I did have one, I think, quite important question that came up uh, last time. And as always, you know, you're free to email me between classes and I can, I, if, I, if I don't know the answer during the class or um, I don't cover it, I can always, I can, I can uh, canvas the experts. And this is what I found out about this following question. Someone asked me, um, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, anyone who was raised in or had any contact with Pentecostalism uh, or has had, has heard this term, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And usually what's meant by that is a sort of additional, um, uh, almost demonstration that you have received the Holy Spirit 
And it's commonly understood as uh, manifested through the speaking of tongues or being uh, collapsing in some, having almost like a seizure, which is being called being slain in the spirit. Uh, but there are other ways uh, that this is usually that this is described. Now, the first thing to say up front, traditionally speaking, um, there is this redundancy. The baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That, that what happens, what we believe happens in baptism is you receive the Holy Spirit. That's what makes you a Christian. You receive the Holy Spirit. The Christian, at the, almost the broad definition of a Christian, is someone who has received the Holy Spirit. And that's what we believe, even in infant baptism, that's what we believe is happening. So there's a slight redundancy. But the, the, way, the, the way that this was um, developed, it was really, it, it came through John Wesley's understanding of what he called entire sanctification, that a person during their life on earth could um, almost be, could be completely sanctified. And the sign of that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, but it was an honest way to, um, to label uh, the very real, I think, we, we talked last week about uh, Holy Spirit being linked to experience and enthusiasm, but um, Wesley was trying to give words to the very real religious experiences that people would have. So maybe you're someone who um, went to a summer camp. This is a very common experience uh, among uh, people who are raised in, especially in Protestant upbringings. You went to a summer camp and while you were baptized, you heard a presentation of uh, Christianity of the gospel that moved you in your heart and you maybe made a commitment, you responded to an altar call, you had some sort of a, what felt like an additional um, and pronounced emotional response to uh, Jesus Christ in, or to God in some way. And uh, so that, that can take the form of just tears people crying, that can take the form of a joy, that can take the form of, of all sorts of things. But this was Wesley's way of trying to give um, credence to that experience, which is an experience, by the way, religious experiences like speaking in tongues and uh, being slain or uh, experiencing some sort of healing or feeling like God is speaking to you directly or simply an emotional like a like a ice water being thrown over you. These are experiences that millions and millions and millions of people have attested to. They're not as wild and crazy as maybe Hollywood would have you believe. And so this um, that's what's going on when usually people talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what Pentecostalism has done is it sort of, it sort of takes that and runs with it and makes it into a new requirement that unless um, baptism isn't enough, you need to also have these other, these additional experiences. But um, so many of us, I think, uh, if, if you're a lifelong Christian, there have been times when you felt especially close to God, or maybe you've had a crisis point or a breakthrough point or an emotional experience or some sort of holy, really what you would consider to be the Holy Spirit being visited upon you. And that is, um, as you get older, it doesn't, it, it, you kind of almost can't believe it actually happened or you, um, you look back on it a little bit quizzically. Uh, the, the, a Pentecostal would say that you have to sort of remain in that place. Uh, and um, I think that they there's a tendency to probably go a little too far with with that and see it as a um, as a requirement. Uh, whereas Wesley originally was really just trying to put words to do this sort of um, the, the, w whatever that that extra. How do we locate uh, something that feels special without making it a requirement. So that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is meant, that's what's meant by it. And that's the way it's also been misinterpreted. But those of us who are raised in liturgical infant baptism situations, uh, baptism is simply the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, or conversion. I, now that's, that's again, a, a short answer to a very involved question. And I hope I, I did not mean to sound dismissive in any way, but it can be confusing. Um, to folks. So I'm not going to, we're not going to take questions about that. But if, uh, again, if more things come up during the course of this session, please do enter it into the chat or I'll provide numerous spaces uh, for that. Now, today, our topic is 
um, the Christ shaped spirit, the Christ shaped spirit. Now, um, one of the things we dance around in this uh, course is the tr is the doctrine of the Trinity. I've mentioned before that I was I've tried to take pains for it not to be a course about the doctrine of the Trinity, since it's that's such a uh, paradoxical and um, almost meta um, mystical uh, doctrine, and yet you cannot talk about the Holy Spirit without having some sense of the um, of the Trinity. Um, because a, a doctrine of any doctrine of the Trinity that says that we worship a triune God, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, will say that Jesus, uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit could not be more closely connected. They are two uh, embodiments of the same substance, the same God, not two members of the same team with two different wills, but sort of the same pulling in the same direction, but two aspects of the same God. There's a common misperception out there when uh, we talk about the death of Jesus Christ, for example, and they say that God is, a, is in this situation a cosmic child abuser, and how could God do this to Jesus? And that is a very odd, actually, if you drill down into it, you can, you can see the concern. It sounds like God is sadistic and, uh, you know, killing his own son. Uh, but the doctrine of the Trinity says, well, actually, it's God uh, sacrificing himself. Um, that the, that there, to, to make too much of a distinction between Jesus and God, or make too much of a distinction between Christ and the Holy Spirit, or God and the Holy Spirit, is to misunderstand the nature of the Trinity. So it, it, what, 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 what looks like an antagonistic relationship actually becomes one that is, in fact, self-sacrificing, self-giving. And that is a, a deeply important distinction. You can see why that would be made. But beyond simply the, uh, the conception of the Trinity, um, the truth is that we find very more uh, that uh, in the New Testament, that when the Spirit is referred to, that it is referred to in various ways as deeply connected to Jesus Christ himself. Now we have, I have two verses up here to, to seek to demonstrate that. Will someone, uh, will someone volunteer to read uh, the, the first one? Okay. I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Thank you, Charlie. So here you have the spirit of Jesus Christ. This is Paul making a, 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 a leap almost. He's not distinguishing between the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. He calls it the spirit of Jesus Christ. And when he does this, he is, he is referencing Christ himself, who in John 20, which we've read before, uh, this is at post-resurrection. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So here, the Holy Spirit is actually the breath of Jesus Christ. So there is um, the, there, the, the name given to the Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And we also see that the uh, spirit itself is coming from Jesus in this in this way in this breath. We we sometimes sing a song called "Breath of God," which always makes me feel like I need a a, a mint or something like that. But he, uh, <laughs> uh, that's what we're referring to. Breathe on me, breath of breath of Christ. Uh, that Jesus and, and these things are inextricably linked. But to get a little bit closer to the point, Jorg Fry and I'm sorry I, I didn't uh, I should have. Uh, um, made this a little bit more centered. Uh, Jörg Frey is a, is a theologian who's sort of an expert on this. He wrote an essay in a great book in 2014 called How Did the Spirit Become a Person? And he talked about why it is that it's important to uh, identify the Holy Spirit as Christ-shaped. Be because when you look at specific passages of scripture, and here we're talking about Galatians 4 and Romans 8, you see that God sent the Spirit 
but he also sent his son. The spirit indwells believers as does Christ. The spirit intercedes for those who believe and pray, pray in, God's realm, in God's realm as does the exalted Christ. So the function is looking uh, quite uh, identical almost in these passages. So it's not, we're not making a leap to say that the Holy Spirit is somehow Christ shaped. They're, they're described in, by Paul. And in fact, some theologians have said that the, the, the redefinition or the tighter definition of the spirit as the spirit of Christ constitutes one of St. Paul's most important contributions to biblical theology. Now, I want to say that we're going to get to the end of how, how, in fact, there is a distinctiveness that we're that can be over um, can be overlooked when you, we talk about this. But um, it is important to note, and in fact, it's one of the ways we answer the one of the great questions we've been talking about since the beginning, which is the question of vagueness when it comes to the Holy Spirit. How do you f put sort of boundaries and, 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 and make it so that not everything that you've ever felt or that you want to feel is somehow uh, coterminous with the Spirit? Well, you say, you look at Scripture and you say, well, it seems to be bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, whenever we talk about the presence of the Spirit, we are in many ways, uh, it, we, we can think of it simultaneously as the presence of of Jesus Christ. Um, so I'm going to break it down before we look at our painting for the week. We're going to look at the why why this is the case. And um, in, in fact, the various functions of the spirit that seem to be linked to the person of Jesus Christ. And the first is simply that the, the we're told the task of the spirit is to bear witness to Jesus, to bear witness about him. Um, and uh, here we have um, someone, uh, Charlie, could you read again uh, the John 14 passage? This is Jesus himself speaking. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Okay, now why don't you also then read 1 John 4. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Okay, thank you. So what we see here is that somehow we, we talked in earlier sessions about one of the great roles of the Holy Spirit is uh, to, for the sake of witness and evangelism. Anytime there's evangelism going on in the world, which means simply the spreading of the good news, the, uh, the kind of uh, preaching of Christ and Christ crucified, that the Holy Spirit is active in that. And that's one of the reasons why Pentecostalism has spread so much and has gone from zero to 400 million in a hundred years. It's because that the, we, the Holy Spirit is seen as the engine of uh, evangelism. And so here you see that um, when, when we talk about uh, what, what the role of the Spirit, it's to bear witness, it's to, to, to attest to Jesus Christ himself. So there's a tight link here. And um, in fact, that, the, 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 that second quote from, uh, from the Apostle John is, is even more to the point. It's like if, if the Spirit does not confess Jesus, then it is not from God. It is not from the Holy Spirit if it's somehow not linked to Christ himself. So... Um, now we're going to, um, I want you to think of any questions. I haven't looked at the chat yet, but any questions you have, start to think about them because um, I want to, uh, to look at our painting for today, which is this. Can everyone see that? This is from 1475, which means it is early on in the Renaissance. Um, this was... Um, uh, Andrea del Verrocchio his, uh, was a, a, paint, a famous painter in Italy during the early re uh, Renaissance, and he had as one of his pupils Leonardo da Vinci. So this is one of da Vinci's very early paintings. Uh, now it, it, is, it is called The Baptism of Christ. And what we'll see here is, is one of the difficulties of representing the Trinity in, uh, on actually on a canvas. But before we look at the content of it, let me just give you a little bit 
of um, background because uh, Da Vinci, so at this point in time, most painting was done with tempura and uh, Da Vinci was interested in bringing oil paint into the mix, literally, quite literally. And so the parts of this painting that were painted in oil are all attributed to Leonardo and the parts that are painted in tempura, which are the figures of Christ and John the Baptist uh, and the dove and the hands, those are attributed to um, uh, Verrocchio. But the angel, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the angel who's holding the garments of Christ here on the far left, that was painted by Leonardo as well as the background because it was all done in oil. And in fact, if you look at this angel, the beatific, the face and the folds of the clothing, you'll notice that it is on a, quietly on another level than the rest of the painting. And in fact, if you look at look at the face, for example, and the the the, the hair, um, and especially the shading and the colors um, on uh, the uh, and you. By the way, Christ is standing in the water, which is not that clear. <laughs> Verrocchio was a famous painter, but he was so uh, impressed and in fact intimidated by what Da Vinci did with that small section, the back, he did, Da Vinci did the background and the one angel that he stopped painting from here on out. He said, I'm done. So uh, this is early Da Vinci, but it is, it is no, noticeable for that reason. Um, but it's also a quite a sweet um, painting from a, uh, from a theological standpoint. Now we're here to talk about the Holy Spirit and a little bit the Trinity and its relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do people see? Let's hear, hear from the peanut gallery here. What do you note? Water and the Holy Spirit are coming right together. Water and the Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about the Holy Spirit last week as as much a force as a as an, as a person, and water is always one of those um, one of those those those, those na natural forces that the that is described as almost synonymous with the Holy Spirit. What else? The Father, with His hands, is sending the Holy Spirit. Yes, that is, that's re remarkable. That's not, I mean, it almost looks like the father is a little child up there. Um, that's but because Verrocchio did that. Verrocchio, clearly <laughs> Verrocchio screwed that one up. But the, but there is a sense in which um, the father is sending the spirit and it's a, it, the spirit is a gift in the form of a dove. The dove is almost always how the Holy Spirit in the early days was um, was symbolized, but what else? And, and of course that's direct from scripture, but there's other natural forces at work here. What other, what else do we see? There's also a blackbird. There's a blackbird? What's yes, the significance? I don't know the significance of the blackbird to be honest with you, Jim, but it's there to the right. Um, but, and that's, I think that that's again, an, another natural, we're, we're out in nature here. Um, but what about light? What do we see from the, the, the perspective of light? Light are all around Jesus. What do you say? Light is, is surrounding Jesus. Yeah. Light is flowing from out of this Holy Spirit in almost this sort of comic booky type arrows. But what is the other source of what are the what's one other source of light that we almost take for granted in this painting? The halos. The halos. The halos. Any um, uh, halos in paintings and uh, rays of light specifically are almost always indications of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And not only the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, we, we tend to think of them purely as sanctity. This, uh, oh, you've, you're, you've, you've, you know, I've got a busted halo or something like that, which means I'm, I'm not as good a person as I used to be. But here you have halos. There's not just the presence. It's not just the presence of sort of holiness or sanctity, but it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm just yeah. noticing it looks like there's John the Baptist is holding this sprinkling thing of water over his head, whereas Jesus 
he almost certainly immersed or dunked Jesus. So again, it seems like a kind of a the Roman church interpreting things already. Oh, you mean the mediation here? Yeah, they like changed up what probably really happened in accordance with their practice or something. I noticed in the past we've had light coming down from heaven. Uh, for example, when the uh, woman was reading the Bible, mm -hmm. coming from the top. This one, however, looks like gone because it's darker up top than it is just on the horizon. And I wonder if that's even, the dawning is significant. Um, I don't know if it's significant, but I, th I think you're absolutely right there, Bill. I think you have, um, um, it, 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 the time of day is a little uncertain. And sometimes that has to do with how the different renderings of the painting and how it, how it, uh, if it's, how cleaned up it is. How, what about, what do you think, how effective or ineffective do you, do you, do you feel the, the representation of the Trinity itself is? <laughs> I think it's pretty strong, but I'm fascinated about the blackbird. Can, could that be the devil being introduced here and flying away? You know, I'd have to look that up. That would be pure conjecture on my part right now, but that I, is certainly an option. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm looking at um, uh, also um, someone, John and uh, Bev said that he's being baptized to the cross, which is held by John the Baptist here, which is, uh-oh. Um, which I think is another very wise thing. I, I, I would say that you'll see already the difficulty of portraying the Trinity in painting. It's not something that can really be painted that well. Because when we talk, when I said earlier, it's not, the Trinity is not three members of the same team. Uh, these are just, he, Da Vinci or Verrocchio is, is, they do look distinct, although, you do have the father sending the spirit it it becomes you can see the difficulty in explaining the spirit based on painting because they do look pretty distinct but the one thing i want to 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 uh really um um hammer home here is the spirit as a what we call a bridge principle the spirit as a bridge principle what i mean by that is the distinct role of the spirit here in this painting is as the one in whom the 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 um, the, the the work of God is being uh, um, is being bridged to the actual sort of earthbound existence. Uh, the, the way that one scholar puts it is the distinct role of the Spirit is as one in whom the outward manifestation of the activity of the Father and the Son is actualized in relation to us meaning the spirit is the point of contact between God and creation. And that's why this there's something actually beautiful about the sort of being sent, the spirit being sent from God, that the connection between Jesus Christ and the faith and experiences of, 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 of everyday Christians is uh, the Holy Spirit. So yeah, again, we're back to this. Yep. You had mentioned that uh, the God figure up top was almost cartoonish and, and so is the, the, uh, the dove. But when you get down to Christ, who is God in man, you get an impressive physicality. He's got a tummy, he's got pubic hair, he's got muscularity, he's got days growth, his hair is all messed up. Mm -hmm. That is a human being. Well, that actually shapes into our, our, our next, um, our next uh, aspect of the Christ-shaped spirit. We're going to go to the next slide. And everyone, remember, I'm going to stop again for questions in a little bit. Um, the Christ-shaped means that... Uh, there is something about the spirit can be seen in incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection, because that's what we're talking about when we talk about Jesus Christ. We talk about his incarnation, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Now, when we, I'm going to break this down in terms of what, because what you've just talked about, Bill, is his physicality, God incarnate in the world. So one of the ways in which we always see the spirit at work is through love. Love is, is, um, is, is seen as synonymous with uh, Christ himself, but also with the Holy Spirit in the world. So here we have uh, this verse from 1 John, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed to us among this way. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. So the Holy Spirit is always, um, uh, is, 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 if it's Christ-shaped, that means the Holy Spirit is evidenced 
in, is present where love is. Secondly, in, in terms of the incarnation, one of the uh, when we talk about the incarnation, we're talking about Christ's miracles, his working with the stuff of creation, his healing of bodies and not just spirits. And so when um, you'll see paintings of Christ healing people and the, the presence of the Holy Spirit will be there through a halo or through light or through simply the look on the faces that Christ shaped means incarnation and in incarnation, it means the presence of uh, healing. And this is again, why within Pentecostalism, although Christ Church Charlottesville, we have our healing service that we do. Um, there would be a, a, probably a, a more pronounced emphasis on healing, and those who people who, if you go to if you go to a, um, you know a, a mission trip and you're dealing with the people who are deeply bound up in Pentecostal understandings of Christianity, there will be a strong emphasis on healing because that's where they see the Spirit is at work. Okay. Next, Christ shape means. Uh, not just incarnation, but crucifixion. Who would like to read this verse from Luke 4? We've talked about it before, but anyone up to read that? Um, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Thank you, Deanna. So here, the spirit is what is prompting Christ uh, in, in his temptations, in his wilderness uh, experience that is directly after, remember, it's the Holy Spirit comes down in baptism in this dove, and then at least in Luke, we are told that then the Holy Spirit, which has come down in this beatific moment of, uh, you know, of intimacy between the Father and the Son, then the Holy Spirit sends again, uh, Christ out into temptation to deal with the devil. And so um, we don't, this is one place where uh, I'm not sure um, where that is sort of de-emphasized in at least a lot of American Pentecostalism, that the Holy Spirit is present in, in suffering and in temptation and times of trial. And that the Holy Spirit is in fact, if not the author, but certainly the agent, God, if God is at work through things, through moments of deprivation, and absence, well, then that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's, again, that, that, that is a difficult pill to swallow, but it's also a hopeful one if you find yourself in the midst of these things. So when we talk about Christ shape means uh, crucifixion, this is part of what we're talking about. Temptation, suffering, wilderness. Remember what wilderness, we, 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 I mentioned this in a sermon about Exodus, but wilderness is another word for the place where, um, where uh, all other sources of life dry up outside of God. And, uh, you know, a lot of people would consider a pandemic or a quarantine to be chief of one of those. So um, it means that, if, so if we say that the spirit is Christ shaped, it means that Christ is present in our suffering, in the thwarting of our egos, and God is close the Holy Spirit is close to the brokenhearted. When the psalmist says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, that is the Holy Spirit is close to the brokenhearted. Um, next, Christ shape means resurrection. And there, it, this means that uh, we have um, the Holy Spirit is, uh, is present in moments of rebirth and life new beginning, creativity. And here I'm quoting, I bring the quote from the Psalms, which is uh, from Psalm 104. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and renew the face of the ground. The spirit is at work in acts of regeneration and creativity, and also in the creation of something out of nothing. So um, this is uh, again a um, the creative work of the Spirit, which would be which would still be Christ shaped in that Christ is the, uh, He who who um, is is resurrected from the dead and from whom in in the places of crucifixion we find uh, you know newness of life and we find all sorts of um, fresh ground being tilled. You also have a great 
uh, uh, passage from Isaiah, which I haven't uh, quoted here. I don't have it on me actually, but it also talks about how the, um, the Holy Spirit is that which, which is, which is with bringing newness of life to people. So that's what, but that's not all we mean when we talk about the Holy Spirit as Christ shaped. But before I continue, do we have any more questions? Any more, anyone else want to weigh in? I see that Bill and Lori uh, mentioned that there is a cross embedded in Christ's halo. Let's look, let's go back here and look at that. There, you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Hey, Dave, this is Gordon. I, I want to just ask you this. I was trying to get it to you as a private chat, but um, I'm not technologically able to do that. Um, the, the scroll, um, I said, I'm curious about the scroll below John's left fingers and its meaning. Um, do you see that scroll right there? See the left fingers of John, John the Baptist? Yes, I say, Eke Agnius. Um, what might that have to do with this picture? Um, you can, I'm going to have to look that up, Gordon. That, the, okay. you, you, uh, Dave. This is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Yeah. Thank you. This is the Lamb of God. There you go. And remember that that's they're quoting John there, where he says, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world," that uh, that John the Baptist is able to recognize. Up. Oh, end of slideshow. Okay. So. Um, if there's any other any other thoughts or anyone else want to weigh in? Okay, well then let's talk about the other Christ-shaped themes in the Holy Spirit because it's not just those uh, incarnation, uh, crucifixion, resurrection, though we can also, lots of things can be sort of, you can reorganize it however you want, but there are other uh, Christ-shaped themes here. Um, now what you note is, um, First of all, the granting of wisdom and compassionate insight. When you read, for example, the, the story of the woman at the well and Jesus uh, know, tells her everything she ever ever done, you know, and that he's able to see into her. There's a sense of um, incredible timing as well as insight. And that is associated with Christ and, us, and, and by extension, whenever, when we experience that as Christians, that is the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is Christ-shaped, well, then, then it would stand to reason, stand to scripture, that um, the Holy Spirit grants us wisdom and compassionate insight into other people, especially how they're experiencing suffering or resurrection. Um, secondly, there's uh, the Holy Spirit is usually associated with the uh, calling or gifting and guidance. Calling in that, you know, Christ is always one who, who he calls uh, sinners to himself, but he calls Matthew, he calls uh, Peter to come and follow him. There's, um, when, you, when you talk to not just people in the ministry, but those who are trying to figure out the next step in their life, they want to talk to you usually about vocation and discerning of God's will. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, that, 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 that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, that's the work of the Holy Spirit is to call, to, to, to gift people with certain uh, talents. And, uh, you know, that, that can get, we're going to get further into the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit in the later session. But right now, we, it just suffices to say that like Christ, the Holy Spirit is involved in those things in your life. Thirdly, remember that we've, the, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the paraclete, which means counselor and comforter. Um, the, uh, this is back to the passage that Charlie read earlier from John 14, which is, I have said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. That um, this, in this sense, the Holy Spirit is not um, uh, Jesus Christ himself is a comforter and a counselor, but in, in this specific role, it's almost as if the Holy Spirit is, is complementing Christ as when Christ leaves and sort of fulfilling that same role as Christ uh, departs. Uh, 
but that's a, a incredibly that so anytime you feel comforted advocated for when it comes to god that is the holy spirit because remember we talked earlier about how the spirit of christ is uh, prays intercedes on behalf of sinners that's and the holy spirit intercedes on behalf of sinners that is the advocate that is the counselor that is the comforter fourthly um and this is probably um what, what some would say most important is the holy spirit is soteriological that's a fancy word for having to do with salvation. Soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. So in whenever a Christian understands that they have been saved, and this is usually related to their, your conversion of any kind, that um, that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is appropriates is, is, or applies the salvation that Christ has achieved to you. So this thing that happened 2,000 years ago, uh, and and is the salvation of the world uh, in, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to the extent that that is present to you in your life here in 2020, well, that's the Holy Spirit's work. But it means that like Jesus, who is involved, is a savior, the Holy Spirit is soteriological in that which brings salvation. And that's closely related to this, to this last aspect, uh, which is who wants to read the verse from 2 Corinthians, which I've provided here at the bottom. This is one of the great ones. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Remember when we talk about Jesus, when, um, when John the Baptist is asked if Christ, he has that moment of doubt when he's in prison and he says, is, 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 is Christ, are you the one or is there, shall we wait for another? And he says, go back and tell him this, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the blind receive sight and the, uh, the, um, the deaf hear and freedom is preached to captives. So there is a sense in which Jesus himself was coming to ransom those who were enslaved to sin, death, and the devil uh, to ransom them for freedom. And here you have Paul in Corinthians saying that the Lord is uh, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So there's a sense in which all of us are, um, you know, enslaved or oppressed by various forces. And the extent to which we experience liberation is through the Holy Spirit. Um, the uh, the uh, Weber wrote that the Spirit does, in this sense, does what we cannot do, not just in terms of salvation, but in terms of freeing people from from situations that are too large for them, gives us freedom to recognize in faith that the powers of this world are merely temporary and to defy them with hope. So where the spirit of, of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, um, that's the end of this, that's the slideshow. But it also means, uh, let me just say that the spirit shares and recreates many of Jesus's other lovely, attractive qualities, the delight in children, the deep insight into those around him. Remember, Christ is always described as knowing what is in man, and he sees into people's hearts. And then there's that astonishing sense of timing, and we would attribute this all not only to Christ, but as we experience it today, it is the Holy Spirit. So um, let's see what time we got. It is 1044. I have a last uh, long section here. But before we go there, I want to see what Mike, uh, any, any questions, any comments, any questions. I have um, uh, Dr. Uh, we have one, one response here saying, you mentioned that the Holy Spirit was involved in the phenomenal growth of Pentecostal religion in the last 100 years. What does that say about those whose denomination, uh, whose membership is shrinking? Well, you sort of can fill in the blanks a little bit, but I don't want to suggest that that um, uh, if, if we believe the Holy Spirit is present in times of suffering and temptation, well, then it could be that the Holy Spirit is present in a different way uh, for those whose denominations are, are not experiencing growth. The, 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 the issue that I'm trying to drive home when it comes to the Holy Spirit is that it if you have a high doctrine, a high pneumatology, meaning a... a, a, a um, in, that you're impressed and you, or you, you hold the Holy Spirit, the Holy, work of the Holy Spirit is really important. That means you will be always looking for where God is at work in the world. And not only that, you will be convinced that God is at work in the here and now. Um, one of the ways in which uh, I think 
some forms of mainline Protestantism, we'll put it that way, have, uh, if you over identify the spirit with the spirit of Christ, what would the liability be? The liability would be that you would see that, that, that the Holy Spirit is only active in ways that mimic Christ, but more importantly, or more un unfortunately, you would say that the Holy Spirit is only active in a sort of a 2000 years ago sense which people are in pain now and they're, they want to know that God cares about them today. And so if you have a high pneumatology, you're going to emphasize that God is with you right now. And God does not want, God is not interested, does not ultimately wants good things for you. And he's, the power of God is available to you in the here and now. So sometimes as we've talked about the, um, the fear around the wildness of the chaos of the Holy Spirit, has made it so that people put lots of fences up. And we do that for good reason, but also out of fear. And so um, the, I, I, what I see is a diminishing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it often con translates to a diminishing uh, faith that God is really at work today. So I do think that there is some, um, some correlation between people who refuse to talk about the Holy Spirit and whose churches are shrinking. But that's not the whole story. There's plenty of other things going on. And I don't think for a second that the Holy Spirit has abandoned uh, Christians who confess week after week that, 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 that God is real, that they believe in Jesus Christ, and that we say the creeds. So I'm, I'd, be, well, I'd be very hesitant to um, ascribe the shrinking uh, to that low pneumatology. I would also uh, would not be surprised at all that people who have a high pneumatology would be those who are most active in talking to other people about their faith, bringing new people in, and but because they believe that God is present for you here and now. Dave, I'm fascinated by that, the, uh, what do you want to call it, paradox or ambiguity of that sentence, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, that puts the Spirit as part of the Lord, sort of. It, you can't divine what those words really mean when you put them together like that. Back to your discussion of, is there a, a third thing called the spirit plus Christ plus God? This sentence doesn't answer the question. If anything, it makes it even harder to divine. Yep. I think that you're very, that's a very, very, very astute observation. But it, it, you seem to be given a, a slight key there in saying that if it's a spirit of, if, if, uh, if, if there's nothing but oppression and fear and uh, rigidity, then uh, maybe the spirit's not there. So these are, we're trying to piece together some, some boundaries as for discernment that also don't, don't sort of uh, put man or you and I above the spirit as a sort of arbiter of what is good and what's spiritual and what's not. Are there any other questions about any of this before I move on to my last little little um, uh, kind of rejoinder to everything that's been said today. One observation that I would have is that if you have a very active pneumatology as in uh, the definition of being alive and the Holy Spirit being active is a certain form of experience, mm -hmm. you can also end up dry and waiting for the uh, reaction, uh, react, uh, reactivation of the old days. I remember in 1983 when the Holy Spirit came on me and I want that experience to happen again in this church today. Well, it's mm -hmm. not happening. Well, the, the, the blessing of, uh, of, of our church practice is we believe that that activity is active today and is not defined on whether I fall down and speak in tongues or not. Yes. It's true. The Holy Spirit is active and is present today among us. And, and it is not based on whether um, I fall down, foam at the mouth, do great works as I perceive them or not. It's the truth. Yes, that's, I think that you're pointing to also a reason why people burn out of Pentecostalism very frequently because there's this constant uh, needing of uh, reconfirmation all the time and uh, that God needs to work 
continue to work in the same emotional register all the time. Uh, and that is not true to really life or to what we're hearing about the Holy Spirit itself. The Holy Spirit is present in the wilderness as well as in the mountaintop. Um, and so you have a, um, this insistence, this, 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 what began as an attempt to, again, to, to label moments of, of religious ecstasy uh, becomes a requirement, which becomes a shackle, which is sort of opposed to the, which is not freedom at all. Um, so the, the, you, the, you, you'll see in everything we're talking about in the Holy Spirit, yes, there is an essential uh, pluriformity, I think is the right word, plurality to what the Holy Spirit, it, it does. Um, but there's also a, um, th there's always this push and pull between wanting to know where the Holy Spirit is present and not, as well as a uh, wanting to master it. <laughs> and the mastery piece is what gets people in trouble over and over again. Um, and yet it could also be that the Holy Spirit's work is to free people from that very inclination to need to master. Uh, but the, the purpose of today's uh, discussion is really to drive home the fact that, the, that there is a deep connection, a special, what some would call a special connection between the risen Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit. And that these are some of the ways in which we can give shape to this amorphous, uh, the wind, the light, the water of the Holy Spirit. We're giving it a little bit of shape today in a way that I hope is helpful to you. Now, I'm gonna close by saying that um, while the Holy Spirit is never less than the Spirit of Christ, it doesn't mean that it is never more than that. It is never less than the, than the spirit of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that it is never more than that. What I mean is that when we, sometimes the, the over-identification of the spirit with Jesus Christ has been a way to deny the passages of the scriptures that don't talk about, that do talk about the spirit, but not Jesus, or to reject the spirit's distinctiveness, but ultimately in the, in the hopes of control, in the hopes of control, straight jacketing. Um, remember, there are spots, uh, instances in the Bible where we hear about the Spirit and Jesus isn't mentioned, where we hear about God and, the, and speaking directly to people without the Spirit being there. The, the spontaneity, the creativity, and the simply the contemporary power of God are ways in which the Spirit seems to operate on its own terms. And moreover, there's something ever renewing about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is always, uh, when we talked about the resurrection and creating newness of life, that, um, that what Charlie talked about was wanting to always go back to the past, to the, what is it, to the flesh pots in Egypt, as we talked about, to, to go back to slavery. The Holy Spirit is sort of a, is, is interested in, 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 in moving you on and forward, and that that is a, uh, when we talk about a bridge principle, that the Holy Spirit is the bridge from God to Jesus to you as you are now, it also means the Holy Spirit is a, is a bridge to you in your future, which is ultimately the hope of heaven. So there are, um, oh, someone asked, Frank Alexander, what does numerology mean? Um, uh, Grace Alexander, I said, what, wait, sorry, Grace, what we're talking about is pneumatology, which is spelled P-N-E-U-M-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y, and that is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's a fancy way of, talk, of saying, whatever you think about the Holy Spirit is your pneumatology. It's like a kind of a shorthand, though it doesn't sound very short, but um, that's what a pneumatology is. So today we've had two new terms. Well, pneumatology is one that we've tried to use every single week, but soteriology, again, is anything having to do with salvation. Um, I have, uh, we have, let's see, we have, it's 10.55. We have five minutes for any further questions. I will say that next week, we're going to be talking about this, this uh, dichotomy that you find in uh, in Christ, in Paul, in Augustine, in Martin Luther, between the spirit and the letter, the spirit and the letter. That's something, if you want to read ahead, uh, look that up uh, and try to find uh, this, the, the distinction between the spirit and the letter. And we're going to delve a little bit more into this notion of freedom as it relates to the Holy Spirit. But any other comments or questions or uh, just, uh, yeah, oh, I see someone... 
Is the Holy Spirit present in the Old Testament? Moses in the burning bush, is, the Holy, is that the Holy Spirit? Um, the answer is yes, the Holy Spirit is present in the Old Testament. They talk about even in creation, that the Spirit uh, moves along the waters. The Holy Spirit is there. Again, exactly um, how, where one ends and the other begins is, is, is something that we're going to have to accept as we go forward, um, that there's never any firm distinctions, but you do hear the, the Spirit of God is mentioned in the Old Testament. Not quite, and obviously not in the same Christ-shaped way, though you can map it backward in that regard and see plenty of um, indications. Any further, further thoughts? Well, remember, I, I am available uh, to you. And um, if you have any things you, I, I, I love the feedback so far. So any further, uh, you know, themes that you think that I'm skipping over too quickly or that we want to revisit or come back at me about, um, uh, the door is wide open. I'm really, really enjoying this. But next week, we'll talk about the spirit and the letter. Um, and I, I'll say a closing prayer, and then we will sort of depart. Dave, will you be talking about the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit? Yes, that's the final class, I believe. We're, okay. We're, we're, there, there is a difference there. And Yep. <laughs> um, Donna, be at the ready. I'll call on you. Okay. <laughs> it's in my book. <laughs> Great. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Uh, I can we be conscious of the spirit in our lives? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and part of the goal of this class is to give us a, some uh, keys to discernment. Um, and again, uh, today we've given you a number of the, the ways in which the spirit mimics Christ. And maybe maybe as I've been talking, you've, you've become conscious of, of certain things. And again, the Holy Spirit... Uh, itself is involved in the conviction and the awareness of uh, its its work in your life. So um, this again, the, the, the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of God, we, this is not a, um, again, not a, uh, uh, a, a past uh, um, anarchic or um, uh, force that you cannot be addressed. Like we can ask the Holy Spirit to, for, for guidance. Um, at just as we pray to Jesus, that this is, it's all one and the same. So um, I hope, I hope, in fact, throughout the last three weeks, and I, this is what I've heard from a couple of people, is that they, this is giving some words to how they see God at work in their lives. And if that's true, um, then we will, uh, then, then we've, we're, we're dealing with the Spirit. All right, let's pray. Thanks. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we pray for uh, that you would make us conscious of where you are at work in our lives. Give us new eyes, open our eyes, give us newness of life, liberation, be present in our suffering, be, 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 be the uh, source of, um, of, of, of healing and of love. We ask uh, for just an abundance of your spirit today and this week and um, at this church. In uh, Jesus Christ, uh, we pray in his name. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Okay, everyone. We'll talk to you again soon. Be in touch with any questions. Thanks, Have a great Dave. day. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Have a good week. So, new is a word for the Holy Spirit? Yeah.